The Nightingale Conan Corporation is proud to present the Ultimate Jim Rohn Library, a collection of priceless wisdom preserved in sound by one of the greatest personal development speakers and philosophers in history, Mr. Jim Rohn. Emmanuel James Jim Rohn was born in Yakima, Washington, to Emmanuel and Clara Rohn. The Rohns owned and worked a farm in Caldwell, Idaho, where Jim grew up as an only child. Rohn started his professional life by working as a stock clerk for department store Sears. Around this time, a friend invited him to a lecture given by entrepreneur John Earl Schoff. In 1955, Rohn joined Schoff's direct selling business, Abunda Vita, as a distributor. In 1957, Rohn resigned his distributorship with Abunda Vita and joined Nutribio, another direct selling company. It was at this point that the company's founders, including Schoff, started to mentor him. After this mentorship, Rohn built one of the largest organizations in the company. In 1960, when Nutribio expanded into Canada, Schoff and the other founders selected Rohn as a vice president for the organization. After Nutribio went out of business in the early 1960s, Rohn was invited to speak at a meeting of his Rotary Club. He accepted, and soon others began asking him to speak at various luncheons and other events. In 1963, at the Beverly Hills Hotel, he gave his first public seminar. He then began presenting seminars all over the country, telling his story and teaching his personal development philosophy. Throughout the 1970s, Rohn conducted a number of seminars for Standard Oil. At the same time, he participated in a personal development business called Adventures in Achievement, which featured both live seminars as well as personal development workshops. He presented seminars worldwide for more than 40 years. Rohn mentored Mark R. Hughes, the founder of Herbalife International, and motivational speaker Tony Robbins in the late 1970s. In fact, a young Tony Robbins could be found in the back of the room at many of Jim Rohn's seminars, and he actually ran one of Jim Rohn's offices in his early years. Others who credit Rohn for his influence on their careers include authors Mark Victor Hansen and Jack Canfield of the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series, author lecturer Brian Tracy, Todd Smith, and T. Harv Eker. Rohn also co-authored the novel Twelve Pillars with Chris Widener. Rohn was the recipient of the 1985 National Speakers Association CPAE Award for Excellence in Speaking. He is also the author of 17 different written, audio, and video media. The world lost one of its most inspirational leaders and speakers when Jim Rohn died peacefully on December 5, 2009. In this unforgettable collection of audio wisdom, you'll hear selections from some of Jim Rohn's best-selling audio programs from the early 1980s all the way through the mid-2000s. You'll hear him at his most dynamic, speaking from the platform in several live seminars. And you'll also hear him at his most compelling and even his most reflective in several different studio recordings. But whether live or in studio, quiet and reflective or passionate and compelling, when you are through listening to this classic collection, you'll understand why legendary speaker and co-founder of Nightingale Conant, Mr. Earl Nightingale, called Jim Rohn, the most powerful, results-oriented leader and speaker of our time. In this first volume of our series, A Philosophy of Personal Responsibility, we begin with the foundational idea that underlay every major topic that Jim Rohn ever discussed, the idea that you are 100% responsible for the results that you achieve in your life. We'll begin with a segment where Jim Rohn discusses why responsibility is a philosophy that is the major determining factor in how your life works out. Then, Jim will discuss why taking responsibility is the key to developing the ambition you need to propel you to greater success. And Jim concludes the session with an unforgettable segment on why personal responsibility is a key indicator and determinant of great character. So for this first segment, 
Sit back and take a front row seat at one of Jim's live seminars as Nightingale Conant is proud to present the ultimate Jim Rohn Library. Philosophy, the major determining factor in how your life works out. Philosophy, to form our philosophy, you got to think, you got to use your mind, you got to process ideas. And this whole process over a lifetime, starting way back here when we were children, schools that we've attended, our parents, our experiences, all this stuff that we've processed by the thinking process helps to develop our philosophy. And in my opinion, each person's personal philosophy is the major factor in how your life works out. Here's what I called it in that last presentation when I was here. It's called the set of the sail. Each person's personal philosophy is like the set of the sail. Now, I used to think it was circumstances that ordered my life. If someone would have asked me at age 25, Mr. Rohn, how come you're not doing well? Pennies in your pocket, creditors calling, nothing in the bank, behind on your promises to your family. You live in America, 25 years old, got a beautiful family, every reason to do well, and things are not going that well for you. What is wrong here? It would not have occurred to me to blame my philosophy. I mean, it would not have occurred to me. Saying, well, I got this lousy philosophy and that's how come I got pennies in my pocket and nothing in the bank and things aren't working well. That would not have occurred to me. I found it much easier to blame the government. Much easier to blame the tax problem. I used to say taxes are too high. Top tax rate when I first started paying taxes, 91%. Back then, when your income reached a certain level, all your income over that, 91%. So I used to say that's too high. Now the tax, top tax rate's about 33%. But people are still saying what? Taxes are too... See, but you can't use that anymore. If it's gone from 91 to 33, how could it be too high? Come on. I threw all that old excuse stuff away. Some people found it, though, and they're <laughs> using it these days. My old list. I used to blame the traffic, the weather. I used to blame circumstances, right? People say, I'm too, t too tall, I'm too short, I'm too old. I was raised in obscurity, raised on a farm, parents of modest means, all the stuff. If you were to ask me, how come you find yourself here, Mr. Rohn, age 25, living in America, land of abundance and opportunity, pennies, zero in the bank, not doing well, creditors calling, it would not have occurred to me to blame my philosophy. I found it easier to blame the company, company policy. I used to say, if this is all they pay, how do they expect you to do well? So I figured that, you know, my future was going to be tied to what everybody else was arranging, the economy and... Right? Interest rates. I used to say things cost too much. That was my whole explanation, not my philosophy. Until my teacher taught me better that this is where the problem was, my own personal philosophy. Here's what's exciting about each person's personal philosophy. That's what makes us different than dogs and animals and birds and cats and spiders and alligators. That's what makes us different than all other life forms. The ability to think, the ability to use your mind, the ability to process ideas and not just operate by instinct. In the winter, I'm telling you, the goose can only fly south. What if south doesn't look too good? Tough luck. It can only fly south. But see, human beings are not like a goose, can only fly south. I mean, you can turn around, go north, you can go east, you can go west, you can order the entire process of your own life. And we do that by the way we think. We do that by exercising our mind. We do that by processing ideas and come up with a better philosophy, a better strategy for our life, goals for the future, okay? Plans to achieve those goals. All this comes from developing our philosophy. Philosophy helps us to process what's available. Well, when we get here, we got seed and we got soil and we got some rain and we've got some what? Sunshine and we've got some seasons and what? The miracle of life. Now the key is, what do you do with all this stuff? How do you turn all this stuff that's available here into equity and promise and lifestyle? 
and dreams and future possibilities. All of this that's possible now with human beings. How do you take all this stuff and turn it into this equities and values? Well, it starts with philosophy. What is the seed? What is the soil? What is the sunshine? What is the rain? Is it possible to take some of each of all the stuff that's available and turn it into food and turn it into value and turn it into nourishment, and turn it into something spectacular and unique that no other life form can do? And the answer is yes. But you cannot deal with all this stuff and what to do with it unless you start refining your philosophy. Think, use your mind, come up with ideas and strengthen your philosophy. So the seed and the soil and the rain and the sunshine, this is called, you know, the economy and the banks and the money and the schools and uh, everything that's available out there, processing information, what to do with all that and turn it into equity and value. That is the major challenge of life, my personal opinion. So each person's personal philosophy now is going to determine what you're going to do with seed and soil and sunshine and rain and miracle, the change of seasons. That's it. My personal opinion. Each person's personal philosophy is like the set of the sail. That's what this seminar is for today. Help you to trim a better sail. You don't need a better economy. You don't need better seed and soil. In fact, when it comes to seed and soil and rain and sunshine and seasons and the miracle of life, that's all you got. Now, what if you blame this stuff? Then you're blaming all you got. If you blame the economy and you blame the schools and you blame the teachers and you blame the sermons and the preachers and, and you blame, uh, you know, the marketplace and you blame the company and company policy, what else is there? When some people get through with their blame list, there is nothing else. That's all there is. And if you blame the only thing you've got to work with, I'm telling you, it's called mistake colossal. And not understanding that that's all you've got to work with. And if this is all you've got to work with, then you don't change the seed and you don't change the soil and you don't change the rain and you don't change the sun sign. You don't change the seasons, right? Guy says, I'll take three springs, four summers, Nine falls, no winters, no, you can't fool with this stuff. You got to take it like it comes. Then what do you change to make your life work well? You got to start with your philosophy. Guess what I had to do at age 25 in order to change my own future? I had to change my mind. I had to change my thinking. I had to change my philosophy. I was messed up on what was causing my problem. And once I got that straightened out, that all the stuff I blamed, the government and taxes and the marketplace and the economy and things cost too much, negative relatives, cynical neighbors. Once I got rid of that and started going for where the real problem was, which was me, I'm telling you, my life exploded into change. My bank account changed immediately. My income changed immediately. My whole life took on a whole new look and color immediately. And the early results I got from making these philosophical changes tasted so good, I've never stopped the process from that day until this. And I'm telling you, with a little consideration of the refinement of your sail, by setting a better sail, refining your philosophy, your whole life can start to change from today on. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. You don't have to wait till next month. You don't have to wait till spring. You can start this whole process immediately. I recommend it. Now, some people do so little thinking, they don't even have their sail up. every day. Now, you can automatically assume, Mr. Owen, I say, I can understand that. A few errors in judgment repeated every day. For six years? I'm with my father. I think I told this story the last time I was here. My father, 88 years old, he's never been ill, still hasn't retired. Not long ago, midnight, we're getting ready to go to bed. We've drilled a new well, got some extra water, Got some more acres going. He's all excited. At midnight, we're getting ready to go to bed. My father's eating what he calls his midnight snack. A little bite to eat before you go to bed. Don't have to go to bed hungry. 
And I'm watching him eat this midnight snack. Guess what he had? An apple, a few graham crackers, and a glass of grapefruit juice. I said, no wonder my father's so healthy. My mom taught us all those good health practices. Taught me when I'm growing up, right? I'm an only child. I've never been ill. Passed the big 5-0 some time ago. My two daughters, 32, 33, never been ill. My grandkids, never been ill. I'm telling you, the legacy lingers on. As I watched my father have this midnight snack, it suddenly occurred to me. I know that's part of it. An apple, what? A day. That's gotten to Dallas-Fort Worth, right? An apple. <laughs> An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Good question for this intelligent audience. What if that's true? You say, well, Mr. Rohn, if that's true, that would be easy to do. Then what's the problem? It's easy not to do. It's easy not to adopt it as your own personal philosophy. Or the guy messed up the saying. Guy says, a Hershey bar a day. Say, no, no. You've been watching too much television. It is not Hershey bar. You got to be smarter in philosophy than to fall for the Hershey bar a day when it's an apple a day. You got to be smarter than that. And if you make that kind of an error in judgment every day for six years, I'm telling you, it'll accumulate into disaster. Sometimes the first year you say, well, you know, I'm so healthy now. What difference is it going to make? You've got to be smarter than that. Just because disaster doesn't fall on us at the end of the first day doesn't mean disaster isn't coming. You've got to be so smart that you look down the road and say, will the errors in my present judgment of philosophy, what's that going to cost me in one year, six years, one month, six months? I'm telling you the money cost and the health cost and the success cost is too gigantic if you look down the road a little ways and say, are there errors in my current judgment like an apple versus a Hershey bar? Is that just a good illustration of some of the rest of my errors in judgment? If it is, that's where I found myself at age 25. I started working when I was 19. I met my teacher who helped turn my life around when I was 25. That's six years. At the end of the first six years of my economic life, I've got pennies in my pocket. I've got nothing in the bank. The creditors are calling saying, hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I'm embarrassed. I'm behind on my promises. I live in America. I'm 25-year-old American male. I got a nice family, every reason to do well. And I'm messed up. Now, what's messed up? I used to think it was the community that was messed up, and the country was messed up, and the government was messed up. If those Democrats ever get in the White House, that'll really mess things up. If the Republicans stay in power, that'll really mess things up. The economy was messed up. Interest rates are messed up. I thought all this stuff was messed up. Then I found out that's not what was messed up. I was criticizing the only thing I had to work with. What was really messed up was my own personal philosophy. My own errors in judgment in my own personal philosophy brought me in six years two pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, and trying to explain why I wasn't doing well, living in America, 25-year-old American male, got a family, every reason to do well. Now, once I understood this, here's the formula for failure, errors in judgment, being lax about developing your own personal philosophy. I'm telling you, it's called accumulated disaster. It doesn't matter whether it's your health or your bank account. Guy's got an empty bank account, probably has high cholesterol. Why? Over the last six years, he never paid attention to either one. And it doesn't matter whether it's a dollar or whether it's your money or whether it's your cholesterol count. All you got to do is commit the errors. And just because disaster doesn't fall on you at the end of the first day that you don't eat an apple. You say, well, I didn't eat an apple today and tonight I'm not ill. Well, you got to be brighter than that. Someday you got to leave first grade. The reason we make those first grade desks so small so they won't fit at age 25. I mean, right? You don't belong here anymore. Come on. Now, let me give you the secret to success. The formula for failure, a few errors in judgment repeated every day for one month, starts the weakness, starts the disaster process. You can imagine what happens in six years. Now, here's the formula for success. A few simple Disciplines practiced every 
day. And you've started a whole new process called a whole new life. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. And if you decide today to go for the apple instead of the Hershey bar, I'm telling you, you have begun the process of turning your life around. And if you keep up that process, not only with your health habits, but with your money habits and with your communication habits, with your sales habits and management habits and every other habit that you've got, if you'll start that process, eliminate the errors and replace it with disciplines practiced, I'm telling you, you can start this process of life change immediately. After today, you don't ever have to be the same again. Only by choice. You don't have to walk out of here the same as you walked in today. Only by choice. You can start a whole new process. And you say, well, Mr. Owen, is it that simple? Yes, it's that simple. Where else would you start but with an apple? You don't have to start with something staggering. What if you should be walking around the block for your good health and you don't? What'll that do in six years? I'm telling you, the word is disaster. You could and you should and you don't. Here's an even stronger word. You won't. I mean, don't might mean you're careless. Won't probably means you're stubborn. And either one's called disaster. Could, should, don't. I'm telling you, that's why at the end of five years, I've... Six years, I found myself with pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, creditors calling. Could, should, won't. Could, should, don't is called disaster. Now, how do you change all that? The next six years, I got rich. The next six years, I became a millionaire. By the time I'm 31, I'm a millionaire. How about that? You say, well, Mr. Rohn, what happened? Well, strangely enough, during that second six years of my economic life, the government was about the same. I'm telling you, taxes were about the same. My negative relatives were the same. I'm telling you, the economy was about the same and prices were about the same and everything else was about the same. Circumstances were about the same. Then how come I got rich? How come I totally changed my life? I was not the same. Somebody says, well, what did you go to work on to do all that? I started with my philosophy. I started amending my errors by doing some better thinking, changing my mind, coming up with ideas that I didn't have before I met my teacher. And once that whole process started for me, I'm telling you, I changed my whole life. Within a six-year period, I was never the same. And I've kept up that process all these years. One of the reasons why I'm here is to continue my craft. I don't want the day to come someday. Somebody says, you should have heard Jim Rohn 10 years ago when he was really terrific. <laughs> Guess what I want people to say? I heard him 10 years ago, but you should hear him now. I'm telling you the man works on his craft. I'm telling you the man's done some extra reading. I'm telling you the man doesn't miss a trick. I'm telling you he's worked hard on himself. That's why he's able to deliver like he does. The same thing can happen for you as a teenager. It can happen to you as a mother, as a father, as a business person, as a salesperson, running a business. Doesn't matter. Management, wherever you find yourself. This is the process called personal change. And what I say to start with is start with your own philosophy. Your philosophy is going to determine whether or not you go for the disciplines or continue the errors that's called potential disaster. And everybody has it within their power. Well, it was so happy for me to find out at age 25, Mr. Shove said, Mr. Rohn, you don't have to change countries. But you do have to change philosophy. And if you'll change philosophy, not country, you can turn around your income, you can turn around your bank account, you can turn around your skills, you can become capable, powerful, sophisticated, healthy, influential, all the other equities that you could possibly want out of your life using the only stuff there is and not trying to change any of this stuff. Appreciate all of this stuff with all of its ups and downs, with all of its mystery of why it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Don't challenge this. You don't have to ask for another planet. You don't have to ask for another country. Just ask for another book. Ask for another seminar. Ask for another idea. And you can start this whole process of personal life change. Now, I could spend the whole day on philosophy, because that's where it is. If I could get you intrigued with that enough to study it, enough to ponder it, to where you would pick up the commitment like I did and say, hey, as simple as an apple a day, as simple as a walk around the block, why not start right there? If you don't start there, where else are you gonna start? Might as well start where it's easy and then go to the more complicated discipline. Key. Philosophy.
taking responsibility for whatever happens to you, knowing that you have consciously made the decisions that are now affecting you, knowing that what is happening now, today, is the direct result of your activity, what you did yesterday. Self-reliance is basically counting on yourself. Now, being self-reliant doesn't mean you can't work with others or trust others. Self-reliance means counting on yourself, trusting yourself, being confident with yourself, being responsible to yourself, trusting your own instincts, trusting the conclusions that you have developed from your study of experiences and philosophies, taking the credit that is due you, learning from the mistakes that you have made, being self-reliant. Gestalt psychologists give an example of being self-reliant. They say that you're responsible for getting caught in the rain. They say that by deciding not to carry an umbrella every day, you have made the decision to endure an occasional drenching. Translation, by not being prepared, you make the choice of getting caught in some of life's unpleasant circumstances. Be they rain, failures, economic losses, relationship losses, professional losses, personal losses. By not being prepared, thinking ahead, it's your choice. Now here's the other side of it. By being prepared, you increase your chances of success, of seizing opportunities when they come your way, of being ready within yourself to take advantage of once-in-a-lifetime situations. Some people tend to blame others for their mistakes, blame others for their failures. Somebody says, it's not my fault the report isn't done. So-and-so didn't do their part. Of course it's your fault. It's your report too. It's your responsibility to see that everyone you delegated work to does their part. Now, you can't control what others around you do, but it's in your own best self-interest your enlightened self-interest, that you stay on top of things, especially if it's going to affect your future. You think your boss cares that John didn't do his part? You think he sees John as the bad guy? Of course not. All he sees is that the report isn't done, bottom line. Be responsible for the things that affect you. You can make sure you're more responsible by checking in with those people who are working with you, the people who make up your team. You can be more responsible by saying, Hey, John, how are you doing with your part? Do you need some help? Can we put somebody else in here to help you finish? Now, if John consistently doesn't handle his part, you've got to replace John. If he isn't doing his share, you've got to find somebody that will. Or what? It will negatively affect you. You can't wake up in the morning that the project is due hoping and wishing that John has done his part. No, you've got to be responsible because it's going to affect your career too. Now, my approach to my better future very early on in my career was to just go through the day with my fingers crossed. And I used to say something like, I sure hope things will change for the better. Then here's what I found out they're not going to change. Somebody says, well then, how will my life ever change? Answer, when you change. When you change, when you get better, it'll get better. If you change, it'll all change. Don't put it on someone else. Hope that someone else will change it for you. Take responsibility for yourself. Take personal responsibility. You can't change the circumstances or the seasons or the wind, but you can change your reading habits. You can change whether or not you go for the skills, burn the midnight oil, turn yourself around, multiply your value by two, three, five, ten. That you've got charge of. That you have control of. You don't have control of the constellations, but you've got control over whether or not you go to night school Take adult classes, learn some new skills, you have control over that, and if you don't, that's your fault. You've got to take personal responsibility. You've got to be self-reliant. You, you, you. 
Nobody else can change your life, alter your ambitions, pave a golden road for you. But you can. It's up to you. Be responsible for yourself. Learn to reap the harvest without complaint. This is a sign of growing maturity. And here's where it comes from, taking full responsibility. Take full responsibility for everything you do. Be responsible to yourself. It's your crop. Whatever your paycheck is, take full responsibility. You say, well, it's my employer. No, it's not your employer. You can become twice as valuable, three times as valuable. Burn the midnight oil, learn some more skills, bring more value to the marketplace. I'm telling you, whatever your harvest is, take it without complaint. Take it without blaming others. Self-preparation leads to control over your life. Whenever you prepare correctly, taking all of the steps you're supposed to take, doing everything in your power to stay on track, whenever your preparations lead to success, achieving your goals, you reinforce the disciplines that got you there. Success leads to reinforcement of the proper disciplines. If what you're doing is working, keep doing it. If what you're doing isn't working, change it. When you are doing all that you can possibly do and are successful at reaching your expectations, keep doing it. Success is a reinforcement. Psychologists call this positive reinforcement. We all know about positive reinforcement. That's how we train our dogs. That's how we teach our kids. That's how the trainers at SeaWorld can get a killer whale to do tricks and follow commands and work side by side with humans by positive reinforcement. When you bring a brand new puppy home and try to teach him not to mess in the house, what do you do? You reward him for going outside or scratching at the door. When you're trying to get your toddler out of the diaper stage, what do you do? You reward her with special presents, make her feel special for learning something new. When you're trying to get your older kids to crack the books and study, what do you do? You reward them when they get good grades. You teach them that the skills they are developing now will have great positive effects on their lives later. But you reward them now. This is positive reinforcement. Learning that there are rewards for doing something good, something worthwhile, something of value. The greater the value, the greater the reward. The better you do, the better your reward. The greater the value, the greater the reward. A bigger paycheck, a better house, financial freedom. It's all a reward system. Now, there are two major benefits of positive reinforcement. Number one, positive reinforcement builds good habits. If what you are doing, the habits you've gotten into, are building your ambition and increasing your success, keep doing them. Your success is reaffirming that these habits are good. Your success tells you that you need to keep doing what you are doing. By reviewing these habits that bring on success, you reinforce them, give them sticking power. Now here's the other side. By reviewing your habits, you may find out that some of them are inhibiting your success. You may find out that what you're doing every day is bad for you. Or you may realize that you've gotten out of some very good habits. Somebody says, well, I've just gotten out of the habit of taking my daily walk around the block. Well, I guess you'll just have to get in the habit of being sick down the road. Somebody says, well, I used to read the books all the time. I've just gotten out of the habit. Then change it. Go back into your disciplines. If you've just gotten out of the habit, just get back into the habit. It's called discipline. If it doesn't work, don't do it any longer. You can keep your fingers crossed if you want to and hope that it'll all straighten out. You can wish for the wind not to blow quite as severely to change in your favor, but we call that naive at best. If the habits that you've gotten into aren't serving you, change them. You can't keep doing this any longer. 
Don't wish for a better wind. The key is to wish for the wisdom to set a better sail. Utilize whatever wind that blows to take you where you want to go. That is the philosophy I picked up at age 25, and it revolutionized my whole life. And here's what I found. I found it was easy. I became a millionaire when I was 31, and I found it was easy. Now here's my definition of easy. It was something I could do. I figure if it's something you can do, it's easy. But here's a little parenthesis. I worked hard at it. I made sure my disciplines were in line. I made sure my habits were good. I made sure I did all that I could. I found something that I could do, but I worked hard at it. I got up early, stayed up late, and worked hard from age 25 to 31. But what I did was easy, meaning it was something I could do. Well, you say, Mr. Roan, if it was so easy, how come during those six years all those other people around you didn't get rich? Here's why. It's easy not to. How else would you describe it? That's it. It's easy to keep doing the things that don't work. It's easy to keep bad habits. It's easy not to develop the disciplines. It's easy not to. So how come I got rich and they didn't? Here's a philosophical phrase. The things that are easy to do are also easy not to do. That's the difference between success and failure, between daydreams and ambitions. Now, the second benefit of positive reinforcement is that it creates the energy to fuel additional achievement. It gives you the drive to do more, to not only keep on doing what's right, but to do more of what's right. The disciplines that will help you grow and get ahead of it all. The knowledge that what you're doing is paying off creates more energy to keep going. How easy is it to get up in the morning when you know you're not doing all that it takes? It's not very easy at all. You can just lay there awake thinking, oh, what's a few more minutes in bed? It won't matter much anyway. Wrong. It does matter. It will matter. Now, how easy is it to get up in the morning when you're pouring it on, doing the best you can, anxious to get going, make progress toward your dreams? It's a whole different story. When you're resting to renew your reserves, it's much different than resting to avoid your day. When you're psyched up and excited for your life, when you're excited for what you've planned to accomplish for the day, it's amazing you'll wake up before the alarm clock even tries to startle you awake. Your successes fuel your ambition. Your successes give you extra energy. Your successes pave the way for more successes. It's the snowball effect. With one success, you're excited to meet another, and another, and another. And pretty soon, the disciplines that were so difficult in the beginning, the disciplines that got you going, are now part of your philosophy. How do you know when you're successful? Do you have to be a millionaire? No. All we ask of you is that you earn all you possibly can. If you earn 10000 a year and that's the best you can do, that's enough. God and everything else will see to it that you're okay. The key is to just do the best you can. If it's 10000 a year, wonderful. If it's 100000 a year, wonderful. If it's a million a year, wonderful. It doesn't matter 10000 a year or a million a year. It doesn't matter as long as you've done the best you possibly can. Earn the most you possibly can. Be the most you possibly can. And here's why. The essence of life is growth. The essence of life is growth to do the best you can. And here's what's interesting. Humans are the only life form that will do less than they possibly can. Humans are the only life form that will settle for less. Every other life form except human beings strive to its maximum capacity. How tall will a tree grow? Approximately. As tall as it possibly can. You never heard of a tree growing half as high as it could. No, trees don't grow half. Trees send their roots down as deep as possible. 
stretch their limbs up as high as possible, produce every leaf possible and every fruit possible. As a matter of fact, you never heard of a human physically growing half. We keep growing until we're done. Now that's a part of life we can't control. It's genetically coded. And that's probably why we keep growing till we're done. Because we can't control that part. It's the rest of our growing that we control. The growing of our minds, the expansion of our minds, that we can control. And that's what tends to get away from us. All life forms inherently strive to their max except human beings. Now, why wouldn't human beings strive to their maximum possibility? Here's why. Because we've been given the dignity of choice. It makes us different than alligators and trees and birds. The dignity of choice makes us different than all other life forms. And here's the choice. To become part of what we could be, enough to get by, or to become all that we can be. My best advice for you is to choose the all. Earn all you can. Make all the friends you can. Read as many books as you can. Develop as many skills as you can. See as much as possible. Do as much as possible. Make as much fortune as possible. Give as much of it away as possible. The max. There's no life like it. I'm telling you, once I got on track, I've never looked back. Pick up the challenge. Go for it. Take the best of the two easies. Take the route of it's easy to get ahead. It's easy to do all you can. It's easy to succeed. It's easy to have financial freedom. The more you do, the more you get. So the two primary benefits of positive reinforcement are, number one, to build good habits, and number two, to create more energy to fuel your ambitions, your desires, your achievements. How can you isolate what's working for you and what isn't? How can you make sure that you are reinforcing your positive disciplines? Well, if it isn't apparent, easy to see right away. If what you're doing is happening in such small increments that you're not sure if you're on track, then you need to be writing it down. You need to keep a journal anyway. But if you really aren't sure that what you're doing is making measurable progress, you need to keep a written record. You need to write down everything that may be relevant in your day. What you did, who you saw, what you felt, how it may or may not affect you now and in the future. The best way to track your activities of the day is to write them down. The best way to track your activities of the week is to write them down. The best way to analyze your progress through the year is to have written it down. Why? So you can look back on it. Because by keeping a written record of your life, you will be more accountable. By putting into writing the action steps that you have planned, you will easily see what works and what doesn't. Most people just try to get through the day, never writing anything down, never keeping track of their progress along the way never really knowing if they are doing all they can to reach their goals, to drive their ambition. But gifted people learn to get from the day. They don't let a day end without picking up some valuable experience, some emotional content, some idea that may positively affect their future. To get the most from a day, to learn the most from a day, you need to be able to reflect on the day. And how can you reflect on a day unless you record it in history? How can you possibly reflect on a week unless you can look back and analyze it? How can you learn from past mistakes and bask in the past successes unless you write it all down? There's something magical in writing out a problem. It's almost as though when you start writing it out, you start figuring out ways to make it work. Perhaps the magic is that when you write it down, you can now be objective. You can start to see objectively where you fit into the picture. You can start to see if you are being responsible, if you are being self-reliant. You are pondering it. You are trying to figure it all out. 
the fact that it is now on paper actually creates a space between you and the problem. And in this space that you have created, now solutions have room to grow. You see, writing about events that occur helps you to understand exactly what is happening. When we describe life to ourselves only in our minds, our imaginations tend to feed back false information about how things are, distorted information. Sometimes our creativity can create scenarios that really don't exist at all if we keep the information just in our mind. But by writing it all down, we now can become more factual, more accurate, more realistic, more logical. And then as we reread what we have written, we create a new picture in our mind. And once we see things as they are, rather than how we think they are, we can see our way to make them better. It's all part of being responsible. But we don't stop to think about the calls we ourselves have forgotten to return while we've been so busy fuming. We can see ourselves writing an angry letter to the airline because a flight was delayed, but we don't write an angry letter to ourselves when we're late for something, even though that might not be a bad idea at all. Yes, we can see avoidance of responsibility all the time in both our personal and professional lives. And here's something else we can see just as often. We can see that most people aren't as successful as they wish they were. Do you see there's a connection between these two very common phenomena? I certainly do. I hope you'll understand that it's in your best interests to take responsibility for everything you do. But that's only the beginning. I'm also going to suggest that many times it's even best to accept responsibility for the mistakes of others, especially when you're in a managerial or leadership role. I can hear you saying, what? Accept responsibility for someone else's mess-ups? Why would I want to do something like that? Well, that's a fair enough question, and over the next few minutes, I'll try to answer it. During the years when professional basketball was just beginning to become really popular, Bill Russell, who played center for the Boston Celtics, was one of the greatest players in the pro league. He was especially known for his rebounding and his defensive skills. But like a lot of very tall centers, Russell was never much of a free-throw shooter. His free-throw percentage was quite a bit below average, in fact. But this low percentage didn't really give a clear picture of Russell's ability as an athlete. And in one game, he gave a very convincing demonstration of this. It was the final game of a championship series between Boston and the Los Angeles Lakers. With about 12 seconds left to play, the Lakers were behind by one point, and Boston had the ball. It was obvious that the Lakers would have to foul one of Boston's players in order to get the ball back and they chose to foul Bill Russell. This was a perfectly logical choice, since statistically, Russell was the worst free-throw shooter on the court at that moment. If he missed the shot, the Lakers would probably get the ball back, and they'd still have enough time to try to win the game. But if Russell made his first free-throw, the Lakers' chances would be seriously diminished, and if he made both shots the game would essentially be over. Bill Russell had a very peculiar style of shooting free throws. Today, no self-respecting basketball player anywhere in America would attempt it. 
Aside from the question of whether it's an effective way to shoot a basket, it just looked too ridiculous. Whenever he had to shoot a free throw, the six foot eleven Russell would start off holding the ball in both hands about waist high. Then he'd squat down, and as he straightened up, he'd let go of the ball. It looked like he was trying to throw a bucket of dirt over a wall. But regardless of how he looked, as soon as Bill Russell was fouled, he knew the Celtics were going to win the game. He was absolutely certain of it. Because in a situation like this, statistics and percentages mean nothing. There was a much more important factor at work. Something that no one has found a way to express in numbers and decimal points. Simply put, Bill Russell was a player who wanted to take responsibility for the success or failure of his team. He wanted the weight on his shoulders in a situation like this. No possibility for excuses. No possibility of blaming anyone else if the game was lost. No second guessing. Bill Russell wanted the ball in his own hands and nobody else's. And like magic, even if he'd missed every free throw he'd ever shot in his life before this, he knew he was going to make this one. And that is exactly what happened. That is what virtually always happens when a man or woman accepts responsibility eagerly and with confidence. I've always felt. That accepting responsibility is one of the highest forms of human maturity, a willingness to be accountable, to put yourself on the line, is really the defining characteristic of adulthood. Anyone who has raised children knows how true this is. Just look at a baby during the first few years of life. Every gesture, every facial expression, every tentative word has one message for the baby's parents. The message is. I am totally dependent on you. I can't do anything for myself, even if I try. I can't be held responsible for the consequences. After all, I'm just a baby. Ten or twelve years later, of course, as the boy or girl enters adolescence, this message to the parents will be very different. It will sound something like this: Why don't you just leave me alone? I want to be totally independent. I don't want to do anything but think about myself. I certainly don't want to accept any responsibility for anything beyond my own very well-defined needs and desires. It's only when we're at last grown up that the first two messages: "I'm totally dependent on you" and "I'm totally independent of you" finally turn into "You can depend on me," which is the truly. Adult outlook, strange as it may seem, of course, there are people in their thirties and forties who are still acting like adolescents, and there are even people in their forties and fifties who are still acting like babies as far as their attitude toward responsibility is concerned. These kinds of people can be hard to have around, especially if you have to work with them. But the large number of people who shirk responsibility. Can also provide opportunities for you if you are determined to be different. If you decide to be one of the few who embraces responsibility, you can lead, and you will deserve to lead. Churchill said, "Responsibility is the price of greatness," and in my opinion, it's really a rather small price to pay. Let me be more specific about exactly what is involved in becoming a responsible person. It means, first of all, that you accept the consequences of your actions. But I'll go even further than that. Responsibility means you look to yourself as the source of everything that happens to you. It means that you assume command, regardless of the hardships you may have undergone early in life. Or the prejudice you may have encountered, or the dozens of people who may have failed to understand you. Do you detect a note of irony in my voice, or perhaps a note of sarcasm? Do I sound hard-hearted? Do I seem to be denying the existence of difficult childhoods, or of prejudice, or of people who are insensitive 
to the needs of others? Well, that is certainly not my intention, nor is it my belief. I'm saying that regardless of the presence of those negative influences in your life, the best thing you can do, the most empowering thing, the strongest thing, and ultimately the wisest thing, is to accept responsibility for your own destiny, plain and simple. The benefits of this approach to life have been proven in some pretty dramatic ways. People who have been afflicted by serious illness, for example, appear to have a better chance of recovery if they decide to take responsibility for what has happened to them, despite the fact that it would be easier and perhaps even more reasonable to simply see themselves as victims of fate. There's a man, let's call him John, who had been healthy and vigorous all his life, who had started and sold businesses in a number of different fields before finally deciding to enter law school in his late 40s. At that time, however, he began to suffer some severe health problems. All his life, his main focus had been on success and achievement, and he really hadn't paid much attention to what was happening to his body. For years, John subsisted largely on a diet of donuts and black coffee. And because he traveled a great deal, he also consumed large amounts of airplane food. Inexorably, he was gaining weight, five pounds one year, 10 pounds the next year, 15 pounds the year after that. Of course, John responded by opening a number of stores that featured clothing for overweight men. And he even used himself in his advertisements. In retrospect, This was probably a mistake. It gave him an incentive to gain even more weight. One year, John gained 20 pounds and actually bragged about that fact in his newspaper ads. Then he was diagnosed with severe diabetes. Although John's physicians assured him that the disease was brought about as much by heredity as by behavioral patterns, he was the kind of man who believed that he was the captain of his own ship not a common sailor taking orders from someone higher up. He was a man of strong character. And now in the face of this new challenge, John resolved to begin taking responsibility for his own well-being. As he explains it, all my adult life I've been preoccupied with supporting my family and getting ahead financially. It was a sense of responsibility that I felt, and to a large extent I have lived up to it. But I can see now that responsibility is beginning to express itself in a different way. Providing for my family is not just a matter of dollars and cents anymore. It's a matter of staying alive. It's my health. And it's the health of my family that's at stake as well. John continues, I'm not setting a good example for my kids. They've seen me gaining weight. They've seen me literally brag about it in my advertisements, and lately they've been gaining weight themselves. I think in some sense they believe this is what I want them to do, and maybe they're not completely wrong. In fact, I've been thinking of including my kids in some new advertisements, and depending upon how it goes over, I've had it in the back of my mind to open up some clothing stores for overweight youngsters. John's eyes begin to light up at the thought of expanding his business and cashing in on new opportunities. But then he caught himself. And as he continued to speak, he pounded his fist on the table. There I go again, he said. I've gotten myself locked into a certain kind of thinking. And now I've got to get myself out of it. It's as simple as that. It was clear that John had indeed gotten himself locked into some well-defined thought patterns. But the most important one was the way he saw himself as the cause of everything that happened, not only in his own life, but in the lives of others. The doctors had told him his diabetes might have come on even if he hadn't been overeating and overworking. But John knew that was nonsense. And as far as his kids were concerned... There have been a lot of news reports documenting the fact that American kids in general are heavier than they used to be. 
They just don't get the same amount of exercise as the children of previous generations. John could have resigned himself to the fact that his kids, like just about all kids today, are going to watch television, play video games, and eat junk food, whether he gained weight or not. But he didn't. Baloney, he said, it's all my fault, and I'm going to do something about it. In fact, I'm going to do a lot about it. And he did do a lot about it. John radically changed his diet and his lifestyle. He began ordering vegetarian meals on plane flights. He became a fitness enthusiast and ran several marathons. Although he ran rather slowly, as you might expect of a man in his fifties, he took pride in the fact that he always ran the course three times. On the day before the race, on the official race day, and again on the day after. Instead of opening a clothing store for overweight children and using his own kids in the advertisements, he consulted a behavioral psychologist who helped him devise a system of financial rewards for his children that helped motivate them to bring their weight down, a system that taught them something about money at the same time. John is now in significantly better physical shape, is entering his final year of law school, and is negotiating with several companies to market his behavioral science techniques for reversing juvenile obesity. Sooner or later, all of us face situations in which we must decide whether to accept responsibility for a problem or look for ways to avoid responsibility. Assuming that you have, in fact, done something that has caused a problem of some kind, let's look at the various options and decisions that are now open to you. First, there's the role played by intention. In other words, was the outcome of your action what you intended it to be? And if it was not, should you still accept responsibility for that outcome. This is a very serious issue in the way we think about responsibility in our society. In many areas of criminal law, for instance, the intention to commit a crime must be present in order for the accused to be held criminally responsible. This intention is something quite different from mere negligence. If you leave your garden hose lying across the sidewalk, so that the mailman trips over it and breaks his leg, you may be held responsible in a civil suit, but you would not be prosecuted as a criminal in the way you would be, for instance, if you had used a weapon in a robbery or an assault. But we don't have to enter a courtroom to see the important role intention plays in accepting responsibility ourselves or assigning it to others. Don't you remember when you were a kid and you left the screen door open so that the cat ran outside and was lost all afternoon? What did you say to avoid responsibility? You said, I didn't mean to do that. You said, it was an accident. As I pointed out earlier, there are lots of people who still use these childlike rationalizations well into their middle age. But if and when you decide you want to be an adult, you begin to see the whole question of intention as nothing more than another opportunity for excuse-making, and you should refuse to participate in it. The great thing about excuses, and the really dangerous thing about them, is that no matter what happens, excuses are always there waiting to be used. Anybody can have an excuse for absolutely anything, and people have never been better at it than they are today. But the downside of excuses, even good ones, is that nobody really believes them. I don't care what people tell you, if you make excuses, they're going to know it, and they're going to think less of you. But if you refuse to rely on excuses, people are going to know that too, and they'll admire you for it. This is especially true in business. One of the classic examples happened about 15 years ago. A widely advertised healthcare product from a leading manufacturer was shown to be unsafe. 
and the company responded by pulling every single box off the shelves at a cost of millions of dollars. Was the company destroyed? Hardly. If they had done anything else, there would have been a tremendous loss of confidence, both on the part of consumers and employees. Instead, there was honest acceptance of responsibility for a mistake, and the public image of the company was dramatically enhanced. Contrast this with what happened recently to a leading manufacturer of computer chips. When a new microprocessor didn't perform up to expectations, the company made excuses. It was a minor problem, something that would crop up once in a lifetime, and so forth. Were these excuses valid? Maybe. Maybe not. But it doesn't really matter, does it? So many people use excuses, but nobody really buys them. It's our modern version of the fable about the boy who cried wolf. In this case, the computer chip manufacturer finally took so much heat that they did replace the processors which is what they should have done in the first place. An offshoot of the I didn't mean to do it excuse for evading responsibility is the I wasn't myself at the time excuse. This really deserves to be a category all its own, particularly since it's received so much attention in the courts, where it often occurs in the form of a defense based on temporary insanity or some other stress-related syndrome. A friend tells me about one day when she flew up from Texas to Los Angeles for a joint presentation that she'd be making along with a fellow from New York City. They had planned it all out, very carefully over the phone. A lot of documents had been assembled. But they both knew that what really counts in face-to-face meetings is personal impression. On this score, my friend felt very confident about the L.A. meeting because her guy from New York City was an extremely charismatic personality. A burly and bearded man, always ready with a joke, he never wore a business suit, and his trademark outfit was a plaid shirt worn with the sleeves rolled up, a loosely knotted knit tie, khaki slacks, and loafers. His favorite expression was, Let's get the show on the road. And he always said it with such gusto that he sounded like a 19th century wagon master starting a wagon train up the Oregon Trail. Most of all, he could sell refrigerators to the Eskimos. And of course, it was all because he was so good at selling himself. You can imagine my friend's extreme surprise and deep disappointment when this usually energetic ball of fire completely dropped the ball in their presentation. When they met in the client's outer office, my friend could hardly believe what she was seeing. The guy from New York was just sitting there, almost like a lump. He had no energy left whatsoever, like every bit of vitality had been drained out of him. When the meeting actually got underway, he seemed to grow even more lethargic, while my friend was left trying to pick up the slack. She was puzzled and could see also the incomprehension on the faces of the people she'd traveled all this way to meet. Here was this big guy in a plaid shirt, all but slumped over like the mouse at Alice in Wonderland's tea party. Was anybody going to invest money in that man's ideas? He seemed about as dynamic as a sack of potatoes. As you might expect, it wasn't long before they were safely outside the building and my friend wasted no time in asking what in the world was wrong. In response, this usually energetic man in his lumberjack shirt said something about jet lag. It was all because of jet lag, he explained. He just wasn't himself. The flight from New York had been just too much. He'd feel better in a day or so, but for the time being, he was just not the man he normally was. He just wasn't himself. Well, it was all she could do to keep from laughing in his face. Here was a guy who looked like a wagon master leading settlers across the continent, and he was put totally out of commission by a first-class flight from New York City. What could she say? Jet lag? Is that the problem, she asked? Is that all? 
Well, not exactly, he replied. There is something else. Now she grew more concerned. Obviously, there was something deeply worrying this man. It could be anything. Maybe he'd been diagnosed with a serious illness, or perhaps someone in his family was ill. Maybe his house had burned down. Maybe he was in serious financial trouble. It's okay, she said, trying to sound calm for her own benefit as well as for her colleague. Do you want to talk about it? He nodded. It's sad. Well, I'm sure it is, but I'm also sure you'll be able to handle it. For the first time all day, he smiled a weak little smile. No, he said, you don't understand. Sad is an acronym for Seasonal Affective Disorder. As my friend listened with amazement, he went on to explain that his jet lag had been worsened by the effects of Seasonal Affective Disorder, a mood disorder brought on by the short, chilly days of winter. You're out here in the West, where it doesn't really get all that cold, he concluded, sounding totally miserable. You don't really know what it's like. Of course my friend knew what it's like. We all know what it's like. And what it's like is excuses, evasion of responsibility, acting like a child, refusing to grow up. You can call it jet lag or sad or whatever you want, but it doesn't really matter what you call it. My friend wanted to tell him what she really thought of his psychobabble, but she knew what the class move really was here, and she wanted to make the class move because she wanted to be a strong character. And remember, a strong character assumes responsibility. If you want to be a leader, you must choose to assume responsibility for whatever happens, whether you have to or not. It's like being at the helm of a ship. You are responsible for everything that takes place on your watch. Don't worry about it, she said. I should have been ready to carry the meeting by myself. Next time, I'll be better prepared. Then she caught a cab back to the airport. Let me elaborate a bit further on the relationship between responsibility and leadership. Bear Bryant once said something about this issue. Bryant, of course, was the coach of many great football teams at the University of Alabama. And until his record was broken recently, he had the highest number of victories of any coach in the history of the game. Bryant said that from his point of view, it was impossible for any of his players to make a mistake during a football game. Any and all mistakes were his, because as coach he was solely and completely responsible for preparing his athletes to play error-free football. By saying this, Bryant was truly accepting a leadership role, and he was embracing the special category of responsibility that comes with it. As a leader, you've got to own responsibility for preparing subordinates for the challenges they'll face, and if the result is not successful, you've got to accept responsibility for not having prepared them adequately. Maybe this seems like a harsh standard to live up to, but that's just the way it is. If you can't handle responsibility and leadership, at least admit it to yourself and don't let other people start depending on you. Choose the standard you want to live by and follow through on. In the ancient world, during the time of the Roman Empire, there was an interesting attitude toward this kind of choice-making. It was a brutal world in those days, to say the least. Anything could happen, from plagues to revolutions to barbarian invasions. Even for the upper classes, it was a challenge just to survive. Yet certain people attempted to do more. There was a tradition whereby people attempted to create themselves and their characters exactly the way an artist would create a painting or a sculpture. And like a work of art, these people looked upon their lives and their characters as things of beauty that would live on after their deaths in the memories of their friends and families. People who chose to live their lives this way were not monks or ascetics or in any way removed from life in the everyday world. They were just very serious 
about building strong character. In fact, the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius was a famous example of this type of person, and his journal is a powerful example of everything that's involved in building character and leadership. Much of it was written in military camps while the emperor was leading the Roman armies against barbarian tribes in what is now Germany. The writings of this ancient emperor and of the other people from the same period reflect a conscious choice to live according to certain standards of responsibility and character. This kind of clear decision about how to build your inner self is something that we rarely see today. Most people want to be good. They want to be ethical and moral and successful in every way. They want to fulfill their potential, but they think it's something that will just happen itself. They don't see that there should be a conscious, ongoing acceptance of responsibility for what you do and who you really are. There's an old saying that goes, I slept and dreamed that life was beauty. I woke and saw that life was duty. If you want to be really in control of your life, and if you want other people to be able to depend on you and look to you for leadership, you must wake up from the dream that somebody else will handle the pressure, that somebody else will shoot those two free throws. I slept and dreamed that life was beauty. I woke and saw that life was duty. Accepting responsibility doesn't mean that life can't be beautiful, but it does mean opening your eyes to the realities a successful person not only must accept. Congratulations! Simply by listening to this first session, you've taken a critical first step toward improving your life, a step others neglect. You see, we know that if you get just one great idea from this program, it will be worth many times over the price you pay. Plus, the ideas we share will benefit you for a lifetime. It is as simple as listening, learning, and applying these great ideas and techniques in your life. When you do, you'll see real and significant improvements immediately.